let's see, I said Revelation chapter 16. We shall start there today. Um, before we read, i say this, that I think that as I look back over a, a long time that God has graciously allowed me to uh, be a preacher. Uh, I believe that, I'm pretty sure, I'm trying to think, it's been a long time, I believe that 1974, 75, um, God allowed me to preach my first uh, sermon, which lasted like 15 minutes. And I know that you think, boy, I wish I was in that one, but uh, for 15 minutes. As I look back, I, I believe that over the years I've preached a, a lot of sermons, a lot of messages on prophecy and about the coming of Christ. I really don't do that so much anymore. I'm not sure why that has worked out the way it has. Uh, sometimes I think we, we like to hear about prophecy, and I like to hear about prophecy and about what is going to happen. You have to be reminded that there is a great deal to cover. There's a thousand, at least seven years. If the tribulation is seven years, which the Bible indicates that it is, and that if Jesus is going to rule and reign for a thousand years, which he is, if there is going to be another great rebellion at the end of that thousand years, and there is, that's a lot of time to cover, and there's a lot of things in the Bible, and some things are easily understood, some things are not. But prophecy is always an interesting subject, particularly the day and age in which we live, because in, in many, many ways we are seeing prophecy fulfilled right before our very eyes. We've spoken about Israel before, that Israel is a sure sign uh, that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled right before our eyes. our eyes. God promised that in the end, if you read Ezekiel 37, and there are many other verses, that God promised that in the end, Israel, which was not a nation, would become a nation again. And we saw that happen in 1948. And uh, the verses there are, are somewhat ambiguous in this. It says that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Many have taken that to mean that the generation that was alive when Israel became a nation again would be that generation that would be alive when Jesus returned. Now that was in 1948, and as you can figure that out, that's been well over 60 years ago. And so we are, uh, uh, some people say, well, how long is the generation? Well, the generation that lived in Moses' day was for 40 years. So if we figured it in that way, we would have assumed that Jesus would have returned in 1988. Edgar Wisnett wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. Of course, that book was totally false. It did not happen. Others have suggested a generation is 60 years. That, uh, and if that were the case, 1948 plus, what, 60 years, uh, we'd still be a little short on that. Uh, some have suggested a, a generation is 100 years. Uh, there's really no way of knowing uh, what it is. Suffice it to say, I believe that Israel, that we are seeing now Israel is trying to be destroyed. The Arabs want to destroy. Uh, no, let's put it like this. The Muslims want to destroy Israel. And I take it to me that this generation shall not pass. The generation of Israel shall not pass. That Israel shall not cease to exist until all these things be fulfilled. So Bible prophecy is always, I always find quite interesting. You can find all kinds of things on the internet about it. There are all kinds of nuts on the internet. Um, I read one article, uh, Jesus will return to the earth on May the 12th, 2012. Well, I guess I missed that, big headline. But you know, it's, there are so many things. The best thing for us to do is try not to set a date. I say, well, I believe that Jesus will come on this date. I've said before, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist got started because a man by the name of William Miller predicted that Jesus would return on October the 1st, 1843. Uh, Miller was a Baptist preacher who set a date. He took some verses out of Ezekiel and uh, figured them not to mean days, which is what they meant, and figured them to be years figured up that that is when Jesus would come in 1843. Well, of course, they all went out on the hillside. They were all dressed in white and waited for Jesus to come, but he did not come. 
Well, Miller then recalculated and said, well, because there is no year zero, that it must mean that he would come in 1844 instead of 43. Again, they went out on the hillside, all dressed in white, and waited until sundown for Jesus to come. And, of course, he did not come. Uh, people have set dates for years. Uh, Harold Camping set several dates for Jesus to return. Edgar Wisden, as I said, set the date of September, I believe it's September the 12th, September the 12th, 1988, for Jesus to come. He even set the, the hour, 1030 Eastern, that Jesus would return. Uh, again, many people bought that, swallowed that. Uh, they uh, sold. Some people charged their credit cards up to the hilt because, hey, I'm leaving. I'm not going to have to worry about it. Uh, and, of course, Jesus did not return in 1988. Wisnett actually came out with another book uh, saying how you messed up and then gave another date. And, of course, Jesus did not return at that time. The best thing that you and I can do is simply this, watch on the prayer. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, what I say to you, he's talking to the disciples, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. We ought to be watching. In Revelation chapter 16, we're going to read from here today uh, and some interesting verses, and verses that uh, people have thought about many times. If you have your place in Revelation 16, let's stand. Well, we shall... Uh, uh, Boy, for the sake of time, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. And thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, True and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof was dried up, at that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together, excuse me, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place call in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we don't always understand everything in it, but Lord, we know that it's true. Lord, we know that it's true, and we thank you for it. Lord, Lord, very Lord, solemn Lord, words today. Lord, and we thank you for it. Lord, I know that many people have different ideas about what the, the vials mean, what they represent, but Lord, we'll just take them for what it says. Lord, this morning, and Lord, believe it. Father, we pray for those. Lord, we pray for those who are without hope. And as Doug and Sarah sang, about one heartbeat away, just one heartbeat away from eternity. One heartbeat away. All of us, Lord, this morning are one heartbeat, one breath away from eternity. 
Lord, we thank you for the breath of life today. We thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to live long enough, Lord, to come to a place where we trusted Jesus as our Savior, where we ask him to save us, Lord, and to come into our heart. What a happy day that was. What a glad day that was, Lord. I know that myself, Lord, I didn't understand everything about the Bible then, and I still don't. But I understood enough, Lord, that I knew I needed to be saved. And I thank you for that. And for every person in this room that's saved today, Lord, we are thankful for that. And Lord, I know that when eternity rolls along, as the ages roll, that they'll be so eternally grateful that they trusted Jesus one day as their Savior. We pray for those who may be listening, who may be watching today, who do not know for sure that they're saved. Lord, for one who may be here that is not sure that they're saved, Lord, for them we pray. We pray for America. We pray for Israel and for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, it, it is somewhat ironic when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, knowing that there is going to come a day when Jerusalem is going to be ravished. Yet, Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for the salvation of Israel. For, Lord, we do know that all Israel shall be saved in a day. And, Lord, we thank you for that. Now, Lord, bless, we pray in the few minutes. Lord, I know that prophecy is oftentimes very interesting. But, Lord, help us not only to find it interesting, but, Lord, to apply it to our lives so that we might be watching and waiting and ready uh, when Jesus comes. Lord, we pray in thy holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. That last verse, we really don't have time, and I mean it, we don't have time. We could spend the rest of the morning on the vials that are poured out. Suffice it to say this, that uh, we have said many times that numbers do have a place in the Bible, that different numbers mean different things. Three is the, the number of the Trinity. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of completion. Uh, Forty is the number of testing. Uh, we find the number seven repeatedly used in the Bible. I marvel you, how many times you find a, uh, like uh, there were five uh, fish or five uh, loaves of bread and two fish for seven. In the book of Revelation, we find seven angels, the seven spirits of God. We find the seven seals in chapter 6. We find the seven seals. We find the seven thunders. Uh, we, we find the seven trumpets. The seven seals and the seven trumpets are at least enumerated what happens with them. The seven thunders... John was about to write what the seven thunders were when God said, don't bother to write. Seal it up. Don't write it. Here in chapter 16, we now come to the seven vials. Each one of the seven are progressively worse, as far as I can tell, uh, that happened here on the earth. And so there are, in, in chapter 16, there are seven vials. We do not read the seventh one in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there was a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. It is finished. Somewhat parenthetical in chapter 16. Somewhat parenthetical, we find beginning in verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, which we would call the unholy trinity. If you read chapter 13 of Revelation, you will find about the beast, uh, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, uh, child of hell, whatever you want to call him, uh, you will read about him in Revelation chapter 13. You will read about the false prophet in Revelation chapter 13. And you will read about the false image. Now it says there, come out of the mouth of the dragon, which would be the devil. Uh, we know that it's the devil. The Bible makes it very clear. Well, preacher, do we know for sure it was the devil? Absolutely. Because it says in Revelation, that old dragon, that serpent, the devil. Yes, it was the devil. So out of the mouth of the devil, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, go these three unclean spirits to gather together. You'll note what it says. The kings of the earth and of the whole earth, to gather them together to the battle. Notice what it says there. Of Almighty, of God Almighty. He said, Behold, I, I, behold, I come quickly. Now in verse 16, and he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. When you say Armageddon, immediately people think, well, hey, there was a movie about Armageddon and, and, and that, but that's not what this is talking about. Armageddon, Arm, it's actually H-R, -har, Armageddon, which means Mount of Megiddo, and the, it's the Valley of Megiddo, or the Valley of Jezreel. Doug, if you throw that picture up there, the first one that I told you to show, I don't know if he can do that or not. Here's a map of Israel, and as you look up there in the upper left-hand corner, 
just down about two or three inches. The Valley of Jezreel runs all the way from the Mediterranean Sea all the way over, picks up that blue line, and then follows down to the Jordan River. From there, it kind of goes down to Jerusalem. Uh, show a picture up there, if you would, Doug. Uh, the Valley of, uh, of Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel. This is that plain. Napoleon said about the valley, he said, that is a perfect place for all the armies of the world to gather. This is the Valley uh, of Jezreel, the Valley of Megiddo. And it, they were all gathered. I think there's one more picture, Doug. Yep, there's another picture of it. Of the Valley of, of, of Megiddo, or the Valley of Jezreel, same place. And the Bible says this about that place. You can take it down, Doug, thank you. That, the, that about this place, that the blood is going to flow in this valley for about 200 miles. Now, jump over to Revelation chapter 19. In chapter 16, and it talks about the Battle of Armageddon, it's somewhat parenthetical <coughs> in this, that it comes between the, the sixth vial. Let me get a drink. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. It comes between the 6th vial and the 7th vial. And so verses 13, 14, 15, and 16 are somewhat parenthetical there. The actual battle of Armageddon itself does not occur until chapter 19. If you'll note there in chapter 19 of Revelation, it says in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You know, we live in an insane world. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Uh, men just butchering and killing themselves. Wars and rumors of wars. I'll speak about that in a minute. But uh, in righteousness, he's the judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, here's a picture of the, picture of the returning Christ. It is somewhat ironic that the Bible never gives a clear picture of what Jesus looked like when he was here. Suffice it to say that Jesus looked like just about every other Jew. The Bible says in Isaiah, there is no comeliness nor beauty in him that when we see him, we should desire him. There was nothing striking about Jesus that when you saw him, you would say, hey, there goes the Son of God down the road. Uh, he looked just like the Bible says uh, one time when they went to stone him. The Bible says that he just passed through the crowd. I've said this before, that he did not have a halo with a bunch of angels flying around his head. He did not have a glow about his face. Say, man, there's something different about that guy. Uh, there is no description of the earthly Jesus other than the fact uh, that uh, he was Jewish. That's what he was. He was olive-skinned. He was not some pale-faced, effeminate, hippie-type, pinko kind of guy. Jesus was an olive-skinned, black-haired Jewish man. That's what he was like. Uh, if Gordon's tomb in the Garden of Gethsemane is the tomb where Jesus was. It is obvious that the tomb was one size and was made somewhat larger for someone else to, to, to lie in, if that is the tomb. We do not know what Jesus looked like. Nobody has ever seen Jesus. The pictures in your Bible are probably not even a very good depiction of what Jesus looked like. Nobody knows what Jesus looked like. Really, that's why I don't have any pictures of Jesus around my house. I know people have pictures of the Last Supper, Sometimes they have pictures of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. But I do not believe that that is a picture of what Christ looked like. However, there are two descriptions in Revelation about what the returning Christ will look like. It says in verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, and without him was not anything made. John 1.14 And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld Him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we have no doubt in verse 12 and verse 13 who it is on this white horse. And the armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses dipped uh, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Brethren, that would be us. We are the armies of heaven following. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This day, the, the battle of Armageddon is called the day. 
It's called the great day of Jehovah. It is called the day of the Lord. It is called the final battle. It is called the end of the devil's rule. It is called the supper of the great God. It is called the great battle of Armageddon. Jesus is returning. We live in an insane world. All you got to do is turn the news on and note that we are probably going to get involved over in the Middle East again. Uh, we're probably going to get involved in that, if nothing more than just attacking, but we may. Uh, uh, most people will tell you that there is absolutely no way for us to win simply by air power. If I know that you're coming to shoot me, I'm going to crawl into my cave. Until you get done, then I'll crawl back out. Uh, uh, we probably are going to get involved in that. But the Bible makes it clear that there is coming a time of a great battle. Now, verse 16 and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, notice it's all in capitals, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, this battle of Armageddon, that ye may eat the flesh of kings. Now notice uh, who is here. Remember we read in chapter 16, these three unclean spirits went out. Now, uh, uh, people think people think that they're going over there, and if the blood flows up to the horse's bridle for 200 miles, well, why don't they just attack with atomic bombs, preacher? Well, here would be the reason for that, because if you attack with atomic bombs, the land's going to be useless. It's not going to be any good. I forget what the half-life is of a, of, a, of a uranium isotope, but it's a long time. Uh, the ground would be contaminated, so they're going to go over there, because the Middle East is rich with minerals and oil. So they're going to go over there. The Bible says to take a spoil. That's why they're going to be over there. And they're going to get there. Now notice what it says there in verse 18. The flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. They're going to buy it by any way, by any means, they're going to come to this valley of Jezreel to Armageddon or Armageddon of uh, the Mount of Megiddo. They're going to come to that valley and they're going to be gathered in that valley for a great distance. I want to jump back to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. We'll come back right there to Revelation uh, uh, 20, but Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. People often surmise, preacher, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? Now let me say a couple things quickly. One of the things Jesus gave in Matthew 24, the disciples said to Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 1, 2, and 3, they said, as they sent over by the Mount of Olives, they said to Jesus, tell us, when shall these things be? Number one. Number two, what shall be the sign of that coming? And number three, and of the end of the world. They asked him three questions. What, when shall these things be? Jesus said, see all these stones? Referring to the temple. There shall not be one stone left upon another. So they asked him, well, when shall these things be? Secondly, they said, what shall be the sign of thy coming? What, what's going to be? Give us something, the sign of thy coming. Revelation chapter 19. What shall be the sign of thy coming? And thirdly, this, they asked this question. What shall be not only the sign of thy coming, but of the end of of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 then proceeded to give out a bunch of, of, uh, uh, of things, a bunch of signs that would point, that would point to him in chapter 19 returning to this earth. He said there'll be disease. Um, you look on the internet, you, you can find, uh, in Florida, in Florida, they don't up here. Uh, they have uh, these, these love bugs, kissing bugs is what they are. They have now determined that there is some kind of a near-fatal disease that they carry from South America up to here. Disease, just all kinds of, of disease. I, I don't know if you heard. I'm not an alarmist much, but uh, I don't know if you've heard. They, there's now a new uh, virus that they're not sure where it came from. It's a breathing virus that it starts out like a cold, like a cold, and within four or five hours, person who has it is pretty much unable to breathe and winds up. The uh, Bible says there will be diseases, 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 diseases. There will be earthquakes. There are like 
three million earthquakes every year. See, I, I told you before, there are always earthquakes going on. Most of them we cannot feel. There's only a, about 150 with a magnitude of over six. But there are earthquakes all over, all over the place. Isaiah, if you, we just don't have time, but in Isaiah chapter 24, 18 and 20, and then in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 25, it says that the earth is going to reel to and fro. Uh, earthquakes. Jesus said that there would be earthquakes. In Revelation chapter 13, uh, it tells us this about that he causes both small and great uh, to receive a mark, either in their forehead or in the back of their hand, this mark of the beast. They now have smart cards. I know we have smartphones. I have a dumb phone, but uh, I know there are smartphones. But they have smart cards. One of these little cards has almost all of your information. It has your passport information. It has your banking information. It has your telephone information. It has your birth information. Uh, it has your bank information. It has your IRS information. And these cards are, are becoming more and more prominent and prevalent everywhere. Now, the Bible says that there will be a mark of the beast. The Bible says this also in Revelation 13 here in his wisdom. It is the uh, number of man, and his number is 603 score and 6, or as most people know, the mark of the beast is 666, and it causes, you cannot, you will not be able to buy or sell unless you have this mark. All right, so wait, they're looking at that mark. And Daniel, if you have Daniel, look at chapter 12 for a moment, chapter 12 and verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting, uh, I'm sorry, some to uh, shame. Let me read it again. Slow down. I'm thinking about three things. It says, and some shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn uh, many to righteousness shall as the stars uh, forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Now that's just the opposite of what God told John. In Revelation, he said, seal not up uh, the things that are written in this book, for the time is at hand. Peter said in 1 Peter, he said, the end of all things is at hand. Now notice what it says. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. And many, what will happen? Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge shall be increased. Many shall run to and fro. I think you realize for the first 5,900 years of man's existence on the earth, we went basically from walking to riding a horse or a horse and buggy. For 50, we didn't progress very far in 5,900 years. But in the last 110, last 120 years, we've gone from riding a horse and buggy to church to now we drive cars. Now we've gone to the moon. Now we can fly across country where it took them weeks and weeks we can now fly across country in three to four hours. The Bible says that in the end, many shall run to and fro. The book of Habakkuk makes it kind of, uh, is kind of interesting in which it, it kind of describes that people will be riding to and fro in like automobiles, back and forth. And so uh, at the time of the end, many shall run to and fro. For 5,900 years, we were basically still on foot unless you had a horse. Man, now we've got automobiles, we've got cars, we've got jets, we've got rocket ships. Um, and people are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to fly in space shuttles to go up in, in the sky and look back down here to see where they live. Many shall run to and fro. But then it says not only that, but it says that knowledge, knowledge, knowledge shall be increased. I'm not sure where people come up with statistics, but I read this. We do live in an inform information overload. We've heard that term. Uh, look, hold your place right there. Hold your place right there. Look at 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 3, because we're going right back to Daniel. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. I wrote the right verse down. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Men are constantly, constantly learning. Uh, on... Online information, online information, online information doubles every six months. Uh, in January of 2008, there are 155.5 million websites, which were 33 million more 
than six months previous to that. Uh, human knowledge, human understanding doubles every two years. Now, now you, you got to think about that. I was talking to BJ about that, but think about that. Knowledge doubles every two to three years, and they're suspecting that it's going to increase that knowledge, human knowledge doubles every, will soon double every year. Now, you think about this for a minute. We're talking about doubling. I've used this illustration before that if I offered you a million dollars today, if I offered you a million dollars today, or if I offered you, now, now think about this, there are eight pennies or eight nails in a, in a, a horseshoe. If I gave you a penny for the four, first horseshoe nail, and then I gave you a, two pennies for the second nail, and then four pennies for the third nail, and then 16 pennies uh, for the fourth nail. I'm a, I've only given you 16 pennies for the fourth nail. You only got four nails to go. If I were to give you a, a keep doubling it like that, would you take the million dollars, or would you take the money for the nails in the horseshoe? Now here, now here it is. I only went seven nails. I only went seven nails. By the time you got to the, to the fifth nail, fourth nail, fourth nail, fourth nail, you're going to get 256 pennies. By the fifth nail, you're going to get 65,536 pennies. By the sixth nail, you're going to get 4,294,967,296 pennies. Now you say, well, now we're talking some real money. By the time you get to the seventh nail, the seventh nail, now, you can't comprehend this, neither can I. But by the time we get to the seventh nail, you're going to get 1.844674444 in, at, uh, uh, you know, keep on going to the ninth with 19 zeros behind it. Now, we're talking about knowledge increasing. All right, we're talking about knowledge doubling. If knowledge doubled last year and then it doubles this year, now we've got uh, two times two. Well, one times one is two, so we got twice. But now if it doubles again the next year, now you've got four times knowledge that you had just two years ago. And if you double it again the third year, now you've got 16. You see, in the end times, knowledge is going to increase. But they're ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. One of the things that is pointing to the fact that we are living in that time, at the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, Look, if there's just one verse in the Bible that said, man, it looks like Jesus returned. That Armageddon is just around the corner. It would be Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And somebody says, well, preacher, what will happen at the battle of Armageddon? What will happen? We're going to jump back to Revelation 20 or 19 in just a moment. But look, if you would, at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. I think that probably the clearest explanation about what will happen. Remember, they're going to be gathered together, together at Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel. Runs from the Mediterranean Sea all the way across Israel down to the Jordan River, then on down to the capital of uh, uh, Jerusalem. They're going to be gathered together to that place. And as you saw that picture, I mean, that was not the, the full 200 miles worth. That picture, they're all going to be gathered together in that place, the Valley of Megiddo, at Armageddon, the Mount of Megiddo. There is a, a, a hill, a tell there called Megiddo, and they are going to be gathered to that place. You remember that the frog went out and the river Euphrates was dried up to make way. We read this in chapter 16. For the kings of the east to come. And Daniel chapter 11 speaks about the Antichrist. We don't have time to read all chapter 11. But we're going to begin in verse 40. And at the time of the end. All right, so now we're talking about the end. At the time of the end. Doesn't tell us exactly when it is. As I said, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, a, a lot of years, a tremendous amount of knowledge here about the Bible. But, suffice it to say, it will be at the time of the end. Uh, shall the king of the south push at him? And I said, well, who is the him? Again, in Revelation chapter 13, we read about the Antichrist. One of the things that is pointing to this is world globalization. Where we find the European Union now has 27 member nations, and there are other nations knocking on the door trying to get in. They've got the European Union, they've got the European Congress, they've got the Euro, which is common. 
Uh, Africa has now signed a, a uh, declaration where all the nations of Africa are, are going to try to assimilate uh, into under one thing. South America signed a, uh, an accord in uh, 2004, I believe it was, in which the nations... Of, look, we're looking at globalization. President George, uh, uh, the first one, I don't know whether he was H.W. He was H.W. Uh, the other one was W. But uh, George uh, uh, Pre uh, Bush, the first George Bush, he talked constantly about uh, a one world order, a one world order, a one world order. And that's what we're looking at. It says in Revelation chapter 13 that this guy is going to rule over uh, uh, the kings of the earth. This guy is. So now in chapter 40, we read, at the time of the end, so the king of the south push at him, the him being the Antichrist. King of the south is going to come up from Egypt, uh, perhaps from uh, northern Africa. And the king of the north, the king of the north, of course, I will refer to Russia. And boy, we see that thing right now uh, uh, happening. Putin, let me just say this. Putin doesn't care one whit about what the president says. Because, you know, it's like, you know, it's like when you were a kid. I dare you to cross. You draw a line and say, I dare you to cross that line. And you cross that line. And he goes, okay, I dare you to cross this line. And then he says, okay, I dare you to cross this line. And that's pretty much what we've done. I dare you to cross. Putin doesn't care. Russia is arming itself. Russia wants to be a player in, in world history. And according to uh, Daniel here, the king of the north is going to push at him. I come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter into the glorious land. Well, what's the glorious land? That's Israel. Where's the valley of Megiddo? That's in Israel. Where's the valley of Jezreel? That's in Israel. So he's going to enter in. The king of the north is going to come and all his armies. If we can understand somewhat Ezekiel 38, it gives a list of those things. May not be the same battle, but he's going to enter in. And they shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power, oh, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and over the Libyans and the Ethiopians, shall be at his steps. All right, so the, 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 the Antichrist is going to move south. The king of the north is going to move down, and the king of the south is going to push at the Antichrist. He's going to enter into the glorious land, and uh, they're going to push. Then tidings, notice this, but uh, in verse 44, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. See, the Antichrist is going to push down at the south to those nations at the south, which are going to push at him. But the king of the north, which is Russia, and all the uh, 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 allies of Russia are going to push down. Then the kings of the east, you'll remember in Revelation chapter 16, that the three unclean spirits went out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the false, uh, out of the false prophet to make way for the kings. And the river Euphrates was dried up to make way for the kings of the east. So what we have now is the kings of the north, the Antichrist, if we understand this correctly, and I believe that we do on this point, is going to come out of Europe. Somehow or other, I cannot explain it all, but somehow or other, the European Union, somehow or other, uh, the, the New Agers, and I don't believe anything they say because they tell us that the earth is warming. You know, there has been no warming of the earth for the last 19 years. Oh, well, we have climate change. But anyway, uh, the New Agers, I don't believe anything they say, but anyhow, so, so they say that the Antichrist is alive and living in London. I've heard my brother mention the guy's name. Now, the Antichrist is going to take control over there. Now, the kings of the north are Russia and their allies. The kings of the south, up out of Africa, out of there. The Antichrist is going to enter into the glorious land, and he's going to push at those guys. But you'll note what it says there in verse 44. Tidings out of the east. All oh, the river Euphrates has been dried up in the kings of the east. That 200 million man army of the Chinese and all their allies but the king, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble. Well, what, what, what's going on here? They've come to take a spoil on Israel. They've come to, to gather, to get all they can out of the Middle East. And now Russia and all its allies are there. Now the kings of the east, now they're all there. Now the Antichrist, that all his armies are there. And the kings of the south are going to push up and they're going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. The Bible says in the valley of decision, they're all going to be there on that day. Now notice, 
Notice this. Tidings shall trouble him, and therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. The Antichrist is going to push back and says, well, I'll show those guys. I'll take care of those guys. We're going to defeat those guys. We'll destroy those guys. But notice in verse 45. And he should plant his tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountains. And he shall come to his end. And none shall come to help him. Now jump back to Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. They have been gathered together to that great place called Armageddon. Where the blood will flow up to the horse's bridle. Who's going to be there? Everybody. You'll note what it says again in Revelation chapter 19. In which he calls the birds to feast. Verse 18 of 19. That you may eat the flesh of kings. Oh, the powerful are going to be there. The kings of the earth are going to be there. Kings out of the east, kings out of the north, the Antichrist, the whole, everybody. They're going to be there in the valley of Armageddon. They're there to take a spoil. They can't use atomic weapons because they would destroy the, the, the land. So they're there, and by any means they're going to get there, by horses, by camels, by donkeys, however, however it is, they're going to get there. And they're all there, the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses. It's going to be a tremendous amount. According to what Revelation says, that the kings of the east will be 200 million men army. You say, preacher, how are they all going to get there? Well, it's a 200-mile valley. They're all going to be there. They're all going to be arrayed. And they're all going to be there for the pretense of taking a spoil. If you look, and we're not going to, I'm only telling you this. If you write down Zechariah chapter 14, you will find that all the armies of the world are gathered together at Jerusalem to take a spoil. Now, now what happens? What happens? We live in, a, in an insane world. We live in an insane asylum. Now, there may not be bars on the window or locks on the doors, but people are insane. I, I meant to say this. They had asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy coming to the end of the world? He says, was, as it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? The earth was corrupt and filled with violence. I mean, filled with violence. I read a statistic. I, I find this hard to believe, but I read it. I, I, I just find it hard to believe. That from 1979 to 1990, there were more people killed by gun violence in America than that have been killed in all of our wars from the revolution up. From all of our wars up was 650,000, and there were 660-some thousand that had been killed by violence. Do we live in a violent world? Absolutely. Do we live in a world where we have to lock our doors at night? Absolutely. We live in a violent world in a world that is corrupt. We live in that kind of world. Now, we live in an insane in an insane world. They're going to all be gathered together to battle at Armageddon. Chapter 16 of Revelation, he gathered them all together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. All the armies of the world, the kings of the world, the valiant men of the world, everybody is going to be gathered in that valley of Jezreel, and there's going to be this tremendous fight. They think, they think that they've been gathered there to fight against each other. But that's not the purpose of the dragon. That's not the purpose of the beast. That's not the purpose of the false prophet. The false prophet and the beast and the dragon have gotten all these people there for one reason. Listen, folks, just about the time it looks like man is going to destroy himself and to do himself in. Revelation chapter 19. Notice what happens. There's this, no, let me put it like this. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to come back. And he's going to come back gloriously. I, and to destroy him, can you explain it? Well, no, but he's going to come, the Bible makes this clear, with the brightness of his coming. It, it, is, it is going to be brighter than if all the stars of the universe exploded at one time. Jesus is going to return in the brightness of his glory, riding upon that white horse, and the armies of heaven are going to be behind him. And listen, there isn't going to be much of a battle. 
Because you'll note what it says in Revelation chapter 19, that out of his mouth goes, in verse 15, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, which is simply the spirit or the word of God. And they're all going to be gathered there in Armageddon for this great battle to take a spoil and to ravish Israel and to destroy Israel and to destroy one another. As we read in Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north and the king of the east and the kings of the south and the Antichrist, they're all going to be gathered together in the glorious land right there in Israel and Armageddon to kill one another. But that's not the purpose of the false prophet. That's not the purpose of the beast. That's not the purpose of the devil. The purpose is to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what's going to happen is that he will destroy them with the great brightness of his power. There'll be a tremendous, Jesus will speak. Actually, I'm not even sure he'll speak because he is going to destroy them with the brightness of his power. And as it says there in that verse, verse 18, that you may eat the flesh, both free and bond, both small and great. And the blood will flow for 200 miles to the horse's bridle. What a great battle that's going to be. Now, in verse 19, there's no judgment on this one. And I saw the beast and, the, and, and, and uh, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war. Here it is against him that sat on the horse and against his army. That would be me and us. We, the armies of heaven, riding on white horses, clothed in fine linen, which the Bible says is the righteousness of the saints. If it, look, I, I've said this many times. I love to read. I love to read. I, I'll read just about anything that interests me. I mean, it, it may not interest you, but when you read about what is happening, and we just simply don't have time to go into all that's happening. The Battle of Armageddon is not that far away. It's just not that far. And they're going to turn. They think that they're going to, again, read Zechariah chapter 14. They think that they are gathered there together to get a spoil. But that's not, that's not the end game of the false prophet. That's not the end game of the devil. That's not the end game of the beast. They are gathered there, as you'll note what it says, to make war against him that sat on the horse and against us. So why is that, preacher? Because men want to be out from underneath of the rule of God. And they're going to seek to destroy. Who is it? According to verse 16, it's the King of Kings and it's the Lord of Lords. I think the orchestra is going to be playing the hallelujah chorus as we come down. Amen. And he shall reign. We look at this old world today and say, man, preacher, this world's a mess. Absolutely. Verse 20, what happens? And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet which wrought miracles before him, which he had, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast. Man, they're in there. Judgment for these guys. They're not brought before the king of kings and the lord of lords. They're, they don't have to answer. Say, hey, what? No. They're taken and they're thrown immediately into the lake of fire. And the remnant, verse 21, were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The Battle of Armageddon. Not that far. We're looking at it. The armies of the, of the earth are forming. The kings of the earth, the kings of the east. China is on the move. China, China is on the move. If they, and there's nothing. I, I'm convinced that one day we're going to wake up and find they've invaded the tiny nation of Taiwan. And we have an agreement with them and with Taiwan that we will defend them and I'm pretty well convinced we're just going to say well okay you can have it. The kings of the north Russia is on the move already now whether Putin is the guy that will be there or not is it, we, we cannot determine that but the kings of the north are on the move the kings of the east are on the move 
the Arab nations to the south of Israel, they're on the move. The European Union is forming. The, U, the, common, the, the, the common market is formed. The, king, the, the kings of the earth are forming. We're just waiting. So, you know, people say, well, preacher, do we know who the No, we don't know who the Antichrist is, and don't bother trying to figure that one out. I will tell you this about the Antichrist quick. Oh, my mercy. I will tell you this about the Antichrist. He will come out of Europe. He will be at least half Jewish. I think from Daniel or from Genesis chapter 49 or chapter 50, he will be of the tribe of Dan. The guy, we, we read all the stuff about gay rights, etc. It appears that he will be somewhat homosexual. He will seek to change times. He is the Antichrist. He sets himself up and opposes God. We're seeing it now. What shall be the sign of that coming and of the end of the world? And when shall these things be? Now, I wanted to say this from chapter 20, but we just don't have time. But let me just say this. We've got three minutes. Preacher, what happens then? What happens after this great battle and all the birds of the air come and they... they Devour the flesh, and the buzzards are there, and the uh, scavenger birds are there, the crows are there, and the uh, birds of prey are there. What happens then? False prophet and the Antichrist, they're thrown into the lake of fire. It's one of the fire and brimstone forever and ever. And there's, they should be tormented both for day and night forever and ever. But then what happens, preacher? The world has tried to destroy Jesus, but boy, the armies of heaven. Now, oh, let me quickly say this, that there will be in chapter 19, after that battle, there will be some righteous people on this earth that will be delivered at that time. Now, so then what happens? According to Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20, the devil will be thrown into the abyss with a great chain, and there he'll be for a thousand years. And then we, the armies of heaven, those who have been saved, those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, those who have been saved by the blood, those who have been washed in the blood, those who have been to Jesus for the cleansing power, who have taken a bite of the bread of life, who have taken a drink of the water of life, who have entered through that door to find green pasture. I don't care how you may call it. Those of us who are the redeemed, according to Revelation 20, and they lived and they reigned with him, for a thousand years. I think about what the earth is going to be like. I can't imagine, neither can you. But it's going to be restored like it was when Adam and Eve were here. Wow. The paradise of God. Say, aren't you glad that you're going to be there one day? Amen. That you're not going to be. Look, we're, we're the armies of heaven. We're riding on the white horses. I, I always love riding horses. Man, I'm going to get my own horse. And it's going to be a white one, like the Lone Ranger had. And I'm going to have a white horse. And I'm going to ride from heaven with Jesus. And that, that, that crowd down there, the kings of the north and the kings of the east and the kings of the south and the kings of the Antichrist are all going to turn on us. But my captain, remember in Joshua, we are done. Remember Joshua, the Lord said to Joshua, get ready, for in three days we're going to cross over the Jordan River. Wow. How exciting. After wandering for 40 years in the wilderness in a circle, the Lord said in three days you're going to go over the Jordan River. And that night, somebody showed up in the camp, and Joshua said, are you for us or are you against us? And he said, I, I'm the angel of the Lord that has come to fight for you. And in Zechariah, I believe it's verse 4 of chapter 14, it said, Then will the Lord go forth and fight for Israel as he did in the days of old. Brother, I'm glad I'm on the winning side. Amen. Man, we look at this world and say, boy, the world looks like they're winning. I mean, Christians are persecuted. Christians are being killed. Christians are being uh, uh, slaughtered all around the world. It looks like, man, we're on the losing side. I got news for you, pal. We're on the winning side, amen? I think of that old song, I'm on the winning side, yes, I'm on the winning side. No more uh, in sin will I abide. Listen, we're on the winning side today, amen? And Jesus may come, 
Uh, he may come today, may come next week, may come. But Jesus is coming again. And we, the armies of heaven, are going to come back. What a great day that will be. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. amen. If you're not saved, listen, if you're watching this morning, if you're watching this morning, you're not saved. Brother, you need to get saved. Friend, you need to be saved. You need to trust Jesus. If you're here today and you're not sure you're saved, you need to be saved. Time is short. Peter said again in 1 Peter, the end of all things is at hand. Now listen, listen quickly. We're done. Man, if you know anybody, if you know anybody that's outside the camp, that's outside the gate, brethren, let's do all we can to get them in before it's too late. Because one day it will be too late, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that they all might be damned who had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let's get them in, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage us this morning. Lord, I sometimes wonder about prophecy. It's, it's good to know it, know what's going to happen. But Lord, I pray that you'll help us to use it in our life so that we might, Lord, be aware of the fact that, man, the end is near. John said the end was near 2,000 years ago. How much nearer is it? Lord, Peter said the end is near. The end of all things is at hand. Lord, you commanded us to watch, to watch. To be ready. Lord, help us to be just like that. To be ready and watching. For we know not what hour our Lord returneth. So Lord, help us to be watching. Lord, we're not setting any dates. We don't know when you'll come. Lord, it's foolish to try and set dates. People look so foolish when they do that. Lord, of course you know that. Lord, we're thankful that you told us that we can know when it's near even at the door. We, we don't know the time, Lord, but we do know it's near. And Lord, so we're thankful for that. Lord, what an exciting time to be living on a stage of world history. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for those who may have been, who may see this program. Lord, if they're not saved, Lord, I pray that they'll trust Jesus as their Savior. To change their mind about being a sinner and change their mind about Jesus. To repent and to call upon him and to trust him. Lord, we're reminded that except a man repent repent to change their mind lord we were all traveling down the wrong road one day but we changed our mind about us ourselves as sinners and changed our mind about jesus as the savior and we trusted him we trusted him by faith lord for those who may be watching who may listen to this program may they by faith trust jesus with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'll ask this question quickly because we are done. Our time's up. I know we've gone over. Is there anyone here today say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'd, I'd go to heaven, but boy, Preacher, I sure would like to know that. Would you pray for me? Look, I think I know just about everybody, and I think just about everybody would say, Boy, Preacher, I am saved. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, maybe, maybe there's somebody you've been here a hundred times, a thousand times, thousands of times, or maybe a few times. Preacher, I'm not really sure I'm saved, but boy, I sure don't want to be involved in that mess when it happens. Would you please pray for me? Now look, our TV cameras are off. Nobody else is looking. If, is there someone here today? Preacher, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. I'll see it, and I'll pray for you. Is there anyone today? Preacher, I'm not sure about being saved, but boy, I sure wish you would pray for me. Now, I won't call you out. Is there anyone? Preacher, I'm not sure about being saved, but pray for me. Pray for me. Lord, I don't see any hands today. Lord, that in a sense is good. Because, Lord, I take it then that everybody here is trusting you as their Savior. Lord, that's good. But, Lord, we pray for those who are outside our camp. Lord, not being Baptist. Lord, we don't mean that. But those who are not saved. Lord, that you would, Lord, give us a burden for the lost. It is nothing more than just throwing a track at them. Try and encourage them, Lord, to plant a seed in their life. Lord, we pray. Help us, we ask. In thy holy and precious name. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'll ask you to stand this morning, and they're going to play just one verse of an invitation hymn. And listen, if there's a need in your life today, if uh, you need to trust Christ today, may I encourage you to step out. I know nobody raised their hand. I know that. But this thing about eternal life is, it's not a matter of life and death. It's more important than that. It's about eternity. 
say, Preacher, I, Jesus said this, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before the angels of heaven. Maybe there's somebody here today say, Preacher, I've never let anybody else know that I'm saved, but I, I sure do. I, I want to publicly confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior. And if you do, if you'd like to come forward, I'm not going to embarrass you or take you anything like that. But if you'd like to let other people know, man, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. And all right. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you again now for this opportunity. Lord, we've gone way beyond our time. Father, I pray that you, Lord, encourage us today. I guess more than anything, prophecy is an encouraging thing because we are encouraged by the signs that we see that the Bible forewarns us about happening in those days. That ought to encourage us this morning. Lord, that, boy, eternity stands before us. What a great day that will be. To be gathered with our friends and loved ones who have gone on before us. We're now patiently waiting for us to cross over to the other side. Lord, we, 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 we thank you for that. Now, Lord, I ask again that you'll bless as we go our way and bring us back tonight, that we might rejoice together and that we might have a good time of fellowship tonight. Thank you, Lord, for all the folks who came today. Thank you for our visitor today, Lord, that we have. And Lord, we're glad for every single person, Lord, in the church today. Lord, we pray that you would increase our number, not for the sake of increasing our number, but to increase those that have found their way into the kingdom of God, we pray. Give us a good afternoon, we ask to Jesus Terry, and bring us back tonight, we pray. In thy holy and precious name, amen and amen.